I am so sorry. I just realized I was on mute. Okay. So sorry. No wonder no one was responding to me. <laughs> okay. Uh, Amy, I'm wondering if you brought something to share with the group today in terms of a health IT instructional item. Okay, well. And um, do you want me just to explain what the students do or how how do you want me to Amy, present this? Amy, I'm afraid we, um, we missed the beginning because oh. um, we had all the lines muted. Um, okay. And I, I can either, I can hand the controls over to you and you can share a file or share your desktop. Actually, I just printed it off, so I can just, it's just an instruction. I can, let me pull it up. Yeah, let me, let me do that. Okay, I'm going to make you presenter. And um, if you go up to the toolbar at the top, you can hit the third item over, which is share. And you can either share a file or share your desktop. I'll do the desktop. I have a split monitor, so let's see if I think it's going to show the right monitor. Can you see my canvas, or did I hit the wrong monitor? Well, right now we see Java is not working. <laughs> so let me go back and see if I can. I don't see the share any longer. Uh, you're still, we can still view your desktop. So you just the need WebEx to get. WebEx or, okay. We can, yeah, okay. that's what we're looking right. at. Now? Ah, I think we're getting closer. HIM 167? So what I did is I took a, um, I infused some health IT components into my health information management program. And what I did was, cause we, we learn about, and I talk about the concept of what data mining is and then data analytics, but there was never an assignment to, you know, have them actually do it. So mm -hmm. our students have access to the HEMA virtual lab, and part of that, one of the components of that is they have access to Tableau, and that's a data analytic tool. Mm -hmm. So you'll see this assignment that I have, and I believe this is the one um, that's also open source for all of you, although unless you had access to Tableau, I'm not sure, you know, I'm sure you could use the same um, website and put it in some other tool or some other program and make it work. But I went on to this website, and um, I'll open it right now. And this is a, an open source website. And it's through the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. And based on the directions of the assignment, um, they have to go through and, and search Medicare and Medicaid for specific principal diagnoses. And I uh -huh. narrowed it down to the ICD-9 ICD diagnosis of 400 to 403, which is your cardiovascular, so your hypertension falls mm -hmm. into that. If it was all, um, first of all, I tried to do the whole 400 category with all cardiovascular, but it just, it was um, way too large of a file to have the students handle it. And then I just went through and gave instructions on how to make a, a table with limited information, because if you go onto this website, you're going to get so many different categories, and it just, uh -huh. I wanted to make the assignment a lot simpler for the students. I didn't want to overwhelm them um, with the first assignment. And once they save a, an Excel spreadsheet with the data, they could then download that into Tableau, and they can actually do data, data analysis. They can graph it. They can see trends over time. They can see um, uh, even, you know, based on year to year, however they want to analyze that data. And Tableau is, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with that, but it's a great software. And um, I actually had a hands-on at the HIMSS conference where they, uh, just took all the hospitals, let's say, in Spokane, and they could compare different things. And, and students can do that, too, based on the data. They can compare, you know, different – in this case, they're, they're looking at different ICD-9 coding diagnoses. So they can look to see, you know, how many patients are in their hospital with a certain um, disease or, or diagnosis. And, you know, then they can pass that on in the real world to actually, you know, quality improvement to try to improve patient care and, 
and do that, which is exactly what health informatics is, is to try to, you know, one, one of the components is to try to improve patient care. Mm -hmm. So they need to have that hands-on tool to say, okay, how are we going to put this in a, a picture display to make it easy and easily interpreted by the user? Yeah, so that that's a great assignment. It's a great activity, and the fact that you're including Tableau um, makes it that much more powerful. I went to a, um, a data analytics presentation last week, and there were a lot of global health people, and what came up a lot is the importance of being able to visualize the data and communicate it in terms of getting support for various projects. Uh, and I, I've heard that Tableau is free to students. I don't it know whether is, that's just I'm a... Go on just okay. to the tableausoftware.com, you know, not with the HEMA lab, and download mm -hmm. it that way. But the two computers I'm using for work already had it on there, so I couldn't see if I could actually access it, you know, not just as a student, not part of the HEMA yeah. lab. But, yeah, I heard that there is a student version. So I'm assuming this activity could be used even though you know, colleges don't have access to the virtual lab. Yeah, I think this this could be adapted to another uh, another system mm -hmm. easily. It's a great ex exercise. Anybody have questions for Amy on this exercise? And actually, I was happy to hear about um, that you pulled the data from the AR AHRQ website because we are wrestling with um, getting good data sets for our, our healthcare data analytics program students to play with. So I think that'll be our next stop. Yeah, it was a user-friendly system. I didn't have a hard time at all. And the students have already done this assignment this year. And they didn't have, other than not reading directions you know, step by step, they didn't, many didn't have problems with this assignment, which is always a good feeling. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Well, Amy, thanks so much. Welcome. And, any, and then will any you questions? take, do I need to do something to give you control? I can take it back. Okay. And Lisa wants to know if we, uh, we could have a, she could have a copy of the assignment. And yes, I can send that out as a follow-up to this session. Because Amy, you, it's the same, it's exactly the same assignment as you submitted to us. It is, yes. Okay. Okay. Chris. Oh, and we have some. Can you, can you hear me? For, okay. Yes. Okay. Great. I uh, just wanted to make sure I had you on mute. So do you want me to, to take control? Yeah, let me pass the baton to you. And there you go. Okay. So, can, can everyone see my Not screen? yet. You, you'll have to do one thing. If you go to the toolbar at the top, third okay. item over, you'll see Share. Okay. And click Share My Desktop. Okay. Okay. Hey. Storyline. <laughs> <laughs> Does that look familiar? <laughs> yeah. um, what I did is, now I don't know if um, I've prepared a whole lot um, of, um, you know, I haven't really prepared a whole lot to talk about this, but um, I'll just kind of give you an overview of what I've done and how I've incorporated this activity into one of my classes. Um, this is the class that I'm showing you right now is in Blackboard. It's the um, Introduction to Medical Terminology. Mm -hmm. And the activity that I've chosen to share is called Heal the Patient. And it actually involves the use of the EMR STAR electronic medical record system, which I know we're going to be talking about later. Um, and so what, what we did, I did this, I worked on this with one of our instructional designers. Um, at our college, and she and I came up with the idea of having a series of questions for the students to go through, and then if they needed to 
have help or for clues, they could go to the MR Star Electronic Medical Record System and look up the patient that um, the question is about, and they could get more information about the patient. So that would help them answer the question that they're given. So it was so really the main objectives here are for the students to be able to have an interactive activity that's that's fun, and then also to be able to tie that into the use of the EMR Star Electronic Electronic Medical Record System. So, um, so when you click on the link in the Blackboard Classroom, then it brings up um, the activity, and when you first um, so so this is the first question that we'll look at. You can see the name of the activities up here on the left upper side of the screen, help you help the patient. And this has the patient's name right now, and it also has kind of the question or a brief description of the condition that the patient is presented with. So the object or the op what the student has to do here is to decide what um, which of the four syndromes <clears throat> or conditions this is. And if you click on the help or the hint button, it'll give you a pop-up fly-by help hint. Um, so then if the student still can't answer this, you know, can't figure out what condition this is, they could then pull up the EMR medical record, the EMR star electronic medical record system and look up the patient, um, which would give them practice in using the electronic medical record system. They can look up the patient, and they would get additional information about the patient that way, too. And so there are, I think there are 10 questions, and the student would just go through each one and then, you know, pull up the hint, um, help if they needed to, and, um, and then just keep going through the next Next question, and um, one of my favorite things about this activity is is the um, is the the interactive the people that they've we worked with. I forgot to add that we worked with Bellevue for to have this part of the activity created. So um, I think Bellevue did a wonderful job in finding the the people that were put into the scenarios. And for example, in this. In this condition, um, for Clara Winston, the patient has lack of growth hormone that result hormone that results in being short in height. So the person next to the question is a little bit is small. Thank so, you, Roger. Um, <laughs> That's Roger Adams, who's on the yeah. call with us. Yes, hey. thank you, Roger. <laughs> Glad you guys liked it. <laughs> you, you didn't know I was going to be sharing this, did you? <laughs> Um, I, didn't. Uh -uh. <laughs> I love all the um the dramatic expressions of the, the, the <laughs> <laughs> so um in this case, this is a condition where um the patient's eyeballs protrude, so you can see the you know the person has very large eyes and um and then this is a question about the excessive growth of a Body due to excess excess growth hormone in a child or teenager, so the person is very tall, very tall and slender. And then um, Jonathan Smith has an enlarged thyroid gland. And Pamela Carmichael has a condition resulting from from hypersecretion of thyroid hormones that can result in exothalamus and goiter. And Tangu Lee has another condition. And so then once you get to the end of the activity, um, it'll tell you your score and what the passing score is. So unfortunately, I didn't pass. But you can also go to, you can click on Review Quiz, and then you would go back through the items. Um, or you can retry the quiz at that point. And I love the fact that it has hints. Mm -hmm. Me too. And, yeah. Um, it, it gives students a little bit of additional information. And it's a really interesting angle to have 
an activity that's kind of tangentially related to an, mm -hmm. EM, an electronic medical record. So students would have to navigate their way there um, mm -hmm. to, to find more information about the patient. It's, uh, it's kind of a nice departure from just the standard go here, go there, look there, here's the route in. Right. It gives them a lot of, a lot of, you know, because it, it, it requires that the student really think their way through it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, have, they have to know, um, you know, how to search for a patient. So it requires certain, certain, for the student to meet, you know, certain objectives as far as working with an electronic medical uh -huh. record. So, you know, even though I'm just using this in one class right now, it seems to be, you know, it seems like it would be a good fit for, you know, incorporating this kind of activity in a lot of the other classes that I'm teaching. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. Mm hmm Okay. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. And I will so, grab the controls back here. Okay. Do I need to do anything? Nope. Okay. They're all set. Um, any questions for Chris? And just a reminder that if you have an idea for a health IT activity and you would like something like that created, we are happy to do it here at Bellevue. We, we have the resources in place. And, and those things can take up a, eat up a lot of time, more time than most busy faculty have. Mm -hmm. um, so, if you have the concept, we can put it into practice. Yes, Vivian, I, I, I could almost feel your wheels turning <laughs> as you looked at Chris's activity. And we had a storyline activity, I believe we showed it briefly last time, but this is a, a I'll just pull it up briefly one more time. Um, one second. I'm just going to share my desktop here. And this is an activity that Vivian conceived of and Roger created. <laughs> okay, so it's, you choose a vehicle. I'm going to choose the stagecoach. And then it asks you a bunch of different questions. And depending on your answer, you're sent in a different direction. I'm going to say true. Nope, wrong. So now it's going to send me down a detour. <laughs> okay, so, you know, the, these are basically, they're kind of like multiple choice on steroids, but the the unique part is you're, you're able to do branching and send students down a different direction, depending on which way they answer. And it's a lot more fun to do it in game format. Any comments or questions on anything um, that people have presented? And Lisa, I know that you're brand new to health IT, um, but many years of experience as an IT professional. So I don't know, did, did you have something that you would like to share today? Yes, I did. Can you hear me? Fantastic. Yes. And okay, shall, I, shall I pass the baton over to you? Sure, that sounds great. Okay, and, and then toolbar share area. Mm -hmm. It's the third item over share my desktop. Okay, I don't see. I see above that is the participants chat notes, polling, PowerPoint it, notes. It, 
if you look to the right hand, the left hand side of the screen at the very top, you should see at the very oh, top. Okay, got it. Ah, there we go. Okay, so I have a slideshow here. And um, the first, and this is really just some draft notes because I, I don't have it flushed out as well as uh, some of the other activities that were shown. But um, the first minor idea would be to discuss data and structured versus unstructured data in healthcare. Uh huh. Um, so, you know, structured data being uh, numbers, dates, et cetera, whereas unstructured data would be audio, video, images. Um, there's some specific examples here too, for example, um, ultrasound images, and what, how that would look if you were trying to store that data. So this is simple, you know, that's in draft form, just simple discussion. Uh, the one that I wanted help with is this, though. <clears throat> I haven't heard back from the people I tried to interview, but this is activity two, redesign your data model based on a business rule. So again, we don't have any courses specifically fleshed out, in, at least in, in our um, IBIT, that are specifically related or integrated with healthcare. But just a, a first stab at it, um, a course I'm teaching this quarter is database theory. So the idea is uh, we talk about relationships between data tables. And so mm -hmm. here's a non-healthcare example, but what I'd like is if you have some great healthcare examples that I could use. Uh, so just quickly, the non-healthcare example here is an employee database and the idea is that there is a one-to-one -one relationship between employee and their address. So the idea is that if, for example, this person's address changes, under the current business rule or the current data model, I would just get in here and say, oh, I have to backspace over you know, their address and type the new one, right? The problem is, of course, I no longer have historical data about the previous addresses for this particular person. You know, could be employee, patient, doesn't really matter. So that's a one-to-one -one relationship between employee and uh, address. Um, in this slide, you see that we've redesigned the data so that we show the same um, data but with a one-to-many relationship. So we have employees here and we have a separate table for their addresses. So, for example, um, my is employee 777. So you can see here's my, when my lived at 123 uh, Harrison. And then you can see here's a later record for my, because my has moved to 801 Broadway. So the idea is, of course, that we have a separate table and we can log any time there's an address change and pull up, and I didn't put all the fields in there. We'd have an effective date probably, but uh, you can pull up the, you know, the most current address. So the point is that if your, um, your business rule is that you do want to track address changes over time for a particular entity, whether it be an employee or patient, then your data model would have to have a separate table for each uh, address change. So I need your help. I'm looking for some really fantastic business rules in healthcare that are that surprise people, maybe who don't have a background in healthcare, that make them realize, oh wow, if, you know, given that business rule, you know, I would have to change my data design and it would have to be broken up into two tables or three tables. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> Does anyone have any ideas for um, striking business rules or great stories? Uh, you know aha moments when someone in IT uh, went to design some data and healthcare said, well, hold on, you know, based on these business rules, you're going to have to rethink that design. Of course, I've, I've got called out to some people, but if anyone here has got some ideas, you know, that's where I'm heading. Amy and Chris, you both have way more extra expertise in health IT than uh, we have here. So I don't know if you have some thoughts. The Elisa. HIPAA rules have to maintain data for six years. Um, I'm drawing a blank if that applies to like HR with um, address changes, but I'm 
pretty sure it would. I'm not 100% positive on that, but I know there's a six-year rule for keeping records of, you know, training logs, um, even, you know, um, access logs, things like that would be six years. So I don't know if that would help. Sure, that'd be one. And it doesn't have to be specifically employee or HR related. It can be any kind of data. Where, you know, for example, uh, what I found interesting, I won't go into the whole story, but there was an interesting story with the Department of Licensing where somebody went down there and had um, and claimed to be um, an owner of a car, which is funny because the, the, the real owner was a woman and the person who pretended to be an owner was a man. <laughs> and they had pretty straightforward. <laughs> anyway, this person was able to change the, the address and, um, and the actual owner, when this was discovered, was furious. Department of Licensing changed the ad said, well, do you want us to change the licensing to your address? And she said, of course. But then once she did, there was no historical record, at least in their system, of the fact that at one time the address was of this other person. Now, you know, huh. There's a lot more to it, too. But the point was they didn't track historical information for address changes. And that actually was important for a legal case. And so, you know, just really neat stories like that. Um, yeah, that's, that's fascinating. How, how data is tracked and oops, you know, business rules maybe that didn't work out so well in healthcare where people bumped into the limitations of the system and, you know, mm -hmm. maybe it went to court and, you know what I mean, that just, it, it, the point is really in that class in the beginning is just to emphasize how critical business rules are. People get hung up on the idea that database design is some sort of mathematical process and that if we can just mm -hmm. find out the right answer then we'll be okay, but there, there is no right answer. It really depends on the business rules, and I know, at least I read, that in healthcare, it's tricky because they're changing all the time, and, you know, that's the trick with the database design. So if anyone has just, you know, great stories that make people pause and really listen, that's what I'm looking for. Like the Department of Licensing. <laughs> yeah. Which, if well, I go on, the car was, you know, the the address was a completely different city. The car was towed. None of the records went to the actual owner. They went to the person who changed the address who, of course, didn't lift a finger. And so, you know, it was quite a, <laughs> an interesting. Yeah. Sounds like it. And, and Chris or Amy, if, if anything occurs to you later on, um, if you could send your thoughts my way, and I'll be sure they get to Lisa. Okay, sure. Okay. I'll be thinking. Thanks, Lisa. Sure. That was interesting. So, I thought it might be useful to spend a little bit of time talking about how to use webinars as a training tool for health IT topics. And typically with a training webinar, I'll often start with just something fun at the beginning and ask people to share one interesting fact about themselves or one interesting experience they've had. So if you could chat in the chat box one interesting fact about yourself or one interesting experience you've had. And be sure that your chat box is set to everyone. Are people just thinking? So can everyone see the chat box? Okay, Vivian. I work from home and I get to sit here with a cat on the desk beside me, okay? <laughs> and Vivian, you have many other interesting things. Vivian is also a novelist. Amy, 
You ran four half marathons in two years. That is impressive. Chris, you backpacked through Europe. Ah, uh, the good old days. Lisa, uh, repeat the question. So it's, if you could share one interesting fact about yourself or one interesting experience you've had. And Sandlin, how about you? Lisa, a bicycle tour guide in Paris. Oh, that sounds like an amazing job. OK. Yeah, China in the mid eighties. It was different, Lisa. <laughs> so <clears throat> I find this to be an interesting way to start off a training webinar with a group of people, particularly if they haven't had a whole lot of contact with each other. And it it starts off it starts people off with the expectation that they'll be participating and it Create some curiosity about the people that are in the room with them. <laughs> Roger, a golden doodle puppy, oh, who is very cute. OK, so in this session, I'm going to imagine that you all are students, and you don't have a great deal of expertise in health IT. You're fairly new to the field. Um, and are the, although our meta objective here for we all is to discuss strategies for learner engagement in training webinars. OK, I'm going to skip this poll because it's such a small group. Um, have you had experience delivering training via webinar? If you could type in the chat box, Lisa, yes. OK, Sandlin, no. Amy, no. Chris, no. OK. Um, how about as participants? Have you participated in a training webinar? Aside from these. OK, so everyone has participated. I'm curious to hear what your experience has been. Um, aside from this one and the, the one we had a few weeks ago, Typically, when you've participated in training webinars, have they been interesting and engaging? What's been the typical experience? If you could write some descriptions in the chat box. OK, engaging and for the most part interesting. OK, Vivian, sometimes it's been like a visual lecture. Lisa, they work well for an entirely online class. Yeah, it's a great way to connect with students. I think the, the advantages of a webinar are that they have the convenience um, of being virtual, but they have a, a more immediate, they have some immediacy, a human element. And let's see, Chris, most of them have been a little bit difficult for me to stay engaged. Chris, I think that that is more often than not the case. Oh, and Lisa, you use them to meet one-on-one -on -one with students. Yeah, great way to establish relationships. So let's look at what works and what doesn't. Vivian, you mentioned lecturing. And Chris, you mentioned that some of them, it's difficult to stay engaged. And some of that is because people will get on a webinar and it'll be straight lecture the whole time. And you have a lot of competition for the participants' attention. There's no um, social mandate for them to pay attention. And let's see, Lisa, the issue is time. We can't require students to participate, so I have tried to schedule them at 9 p.m. Hmm, yeah, yeah, it's true. Hard to get online students all in one place at the same time. 
So lecturing, not so interesting. One-way communication, not so interesting. There is a whole virtual world to distract the participants. Boring slides, one bullet point, another bullet point, and what are people typically doing after the sixth slide that are, that's filled with bullet points? You could chat in your chat box. What do you typically do during a webinar? <laughs> okay, yeah, get something to eat. At least they're paying bills. <laughs> yeah, Vivian, they're surfing the web. Yep. Or if it's during work hours, they're checking their emails. Stan Lim, no one can see you sleeping in a webinar. Exactly. There's no accountability. In a in a face to face class, people feel obligated to, to at least pretend to be paying attention. Chris, tuning out, yeah, unless you're required to participate. Exactly, Chris. Lisa, tempted to catch up on grading. Yeah, all kinds of things. So what are some ways that we can turn that around and really hold on to the participants' attention? So one way is to use images and graphics. Our brains like that. Our brains go, ah, when we see images. What also grabs the brain's attention is novelty. So anything, anything that, that changes, so varying your intonation patterns can be helpful. And more importantly, two-way communication. And Lisa, yes, ask a gazillion questions. Keep the participants busy. One second. So it should be more like a conversation. And hopefully, that's how it feels today in this webinar as a, as a two-way conversation. It gets a little bit um, unmanageable to have everyone with their mics unmuted, and you end up with a lot of background noise. And because you don't have the nonverbal cues when someone's about to speak, people kind of trample over each other. So something that I find works well in webinars is to use the chat pain heavily, but to periodically ask people to unmute and say more about a comment. Okay, so let's plug in a health IT example to this. And Amy and Chris, I apologize up front if I'm at all off the mark um, on this because you have way more health IT expertise than I do. Um, I actually rolled up my sleeves and read through sections of To Air is Human, an Institute of Medicine report, the, a, a famous one from the 1990s. And the learning objectives for this session, and I'm, we're going to imagine that you are health IT students. Um, the learning objectives are to identify common types of medical error and identify ways that technology can impact patient safety. So first of all, have you or a friend or family member ever been directly affected by a medical error? Anybody? Chris, not yet. <laughs> OK. And hopefully you never will be. Oh, Lisa, now that's interesting. You hope not, but you never know. It's true. You can't be sure. Maybe maybe there was a mistake, but nothing really terrible happened. Okay. So let's look at a poll. Okay, according to that aforementioned Institute of Medicine report, about how, how many deaths annually did they conclude occurred as a result of preventable medical error? Hmm. 
Okay. I'm going to close the poll. And let's look at the results. Okay. A couple people thought 117,000. Actually, the correct answer is B, 98,000 in the Institute of Medicine report. Another report has come out um, more recently asserting that actually the number is much higher. Um, there's been a fair amount of controversy about this report. Some people say it's accurate. The American Hospital Association said that they didn't think it was accurate. What's one problem with getting an accurate count of medical errors? And just go ahead and chat in your chat box. Why is it hard to get an accurate read of medical errors? And by the way, most of the medical errors that are tracked occur in hospital settings. Oh, Amy. Oh, and Sandlin, too. Yes, Sandlin, not all errors lead to adverse events. That's one part. And Amy, hospitals have to admit their errors, and providers have to admit their errors. So that is a significant problem. And Chris, yes, some are undetected or unreported. Oh, Vivian. Washington Post had an article about a teenager who was losing weight. It took many physicians and multiple efforts to find the right diagnosis. Interesting. Huh. Yeah, so it's actually kind of, it's tough to get an accurate read. And one of the things highlighted in that Institute of Medicine report was that systems needed to be implemented in hospitals so that there isn't blame, so that there could be some anonymous reporting of errors and that sort of thing so that underlying systems could be addressed. So yes, hospitals may be hazardous to your health. And there are checklists out there on the web of things they recommend you do if you are hospitalized to make sure that um, errors aren't made. What would you guess is the most prevalent type of medical error? What kind of error would you guess? At least a knife left in body. That's a classic one. Um, let's see. Medication. Yeah. Chris, it, medication errors are the most common. Oh, Vivian, interesting. Two hospitals actually I'm surprised that they would make their patients nervous <laughs> saying things that they should pay attention to to prevent error. And Amy, yes, echoed Chris's comments, medication errors, yes, yes, yes. OK, let's have another poll question. So most medical errors in hospital are the, are the result of incompetent providers. We saw this question in the Road to Health IT. OK. And it looks like the results are unanimous. False. OK. So this is interesting. Um, most Errors are human errors. They're errors made by people. Um, however, there's a big difference between saying that most errors are human errors and blaming people for negligence or incompetence. And actually, it's systems that are more often the cause. Back to the Institute of Medicine report, Errors are caused by faulty systems, processes, and conditions that lead people to make mistakes or fail to prevent them. So, I mean, there, there can be very many complex factors. 
that set up conditions that cause people to make errors. So for the next part of this activity, you're actually going to need to print out a handout. I sent it out ahead of time, but Amy, I kept getting bounce backs from um, Spokane emails this morning. That's strange. Um, yeah, I didn't receive it. Yeah, and I, I sent, I tried about three times, but what you can do is if you go up to share, no, I'm sorry, file up at the toolbar okay. and do and do save as PDF. You should be oh, able yeah, to save, down. Save as document, poll question, poll results, yes. chat, the PDF. And PDF would be the way to go. I and don't have any. Question. You don't what? I only have save as document, poll question, poll results, or chat. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, hit document, and then then you'll have a drop down, and you can select PDF. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. Anybody else who doesn't have a copy? Okay. I guess we're we're all set. We'll give Amy a, a minute to um, print this out. So again, we're imagining that you are health IT students and you want to get them engaged in and introduce them to the concept of medical error and the different types of errors that there are. Okay, so Lisa, this is, this is similar to the one that you mentioned, things left in the body. So if you look at the types of errors on that handout, what category does this fall in? Okay, Lisa, treatment, and which letter? Yep, and Amy also votes for treatment. A, yeah, error in the performance of an operation, procedure, or test. Um, how many of you have heard of Atul Gawande? He wrote the Checklist Manifesto. Very interesting guy. You might want to check him out on YouTube sometime. He has some, some interesting videos. Um, he touts the value of checklists, and particularly in medicine. And checklists have been used in other industries where safety has been a big concern, like um, aviation, and used to great effect. So having adequate procedures and following them following checklists. Vivian, yeah, he uses checklists as a surgeon. Mm -hmm. And as I say, to great effect. OK, how about this one? Carol Eng checks into the ER, hangs around for a few hours. At noon, he has a heart attack. So which type of error is this? Yes, yes, diagnostic A. Okay, how about this one?
Yeah, okay. Treatment. Yeah, either B or C. And let's add another part to this question. What kind of technology could have prevented this error? Vivian, yes, an EMR, and getting even more specific, um, Chris, CPOE, and yes, Amy, alerts through the EHR, Lisa, online records. Chris, can I ask you to unmute your line and talk a little bit about CPOE um, for those who are new to health IT? Sure, it stands for um, computerized provider order entry, um, and what it involves is a provider would have to, would go online and use an electronic medical record system to actually enter orders for medications or for other um, services that are being provided to a patient. And during that order entry process, there are checks done so in this case, these medications, there probably would have been a conflict alert that would have been generated to tell the physician that this patient is also taking the MA, MAOI so that the, um, the Prozac would have, it would have alerted them that the Prozac should not have been prescribed. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this next one is the same scenario where someone is is taking an MAOI and they're prescribed Prozac, but this time it's she's being treated at two different facilities. I'll give you a minute to just read that through. Okay, what on the technology front could have prevented this? Something we don't quite yet have um, widespread use of in this country. I think I'm probably not asking the question right, because <laughs> I know several of you um, know this. Um, what I'm looking for is, what I had in mind was interoperability and health information exchange. We have it to some extent in this country, but we're still, I, I was speaking with someone, actually the, um, the person who heads up our EMR STAR effort, he is involved nationally in um, health information exchange. And I asked him how far away he thought we were from really having that in our country. And he, he said he thought 10 plus years. So when we have, when our systems are truly connected and different providers have access to a patient's records, that, that would prevent a situation like this. Okay. So, how about this one? Give this one a read through.
So this one has a lot of problems. Okay, Chris, other C, Sandlin, other F. Yeah, both. <clears throat> There, there are system problems for sure, and there's a poorly, de poorly designed interface, <clears throat> and people will figure out their own workarounds if they have a poorly designed interface or if something is clunky and difficult to use. Any other comments on this one? So what what could have prevented this? Let's start with the process from entering medication orders. What probably did not happen when they were gearing up to implement their EHR system? Vivian, when you're designing a system, it's really important to get user input. Yeah, especially for clinical processes. Chris, yeah, okay, the physicians should be entering the orders, yes. And back to Vivian's point, they probably did not get sufficient um, clinician input, and they probably didn't do enough user testing before they went live with that CPOE system. So in this case, Vivian, the order entry process should be reviewed and probably changed. Yeah. And whoever is doing it should look at the actual workflow. Oh, Chris, you, she points out another important problem that can lead to error is sometimes the systems are fine and the technology is fine, but maybe they weren't trained adequately. Yeah. Another source of error. Okay, so I'm going to skip the next one because we are starting to run out of time. So ways technology can help. Chris explained to us about computer, computerized provider order entry. Um, one example that we didn't get to is clinical decision support. So. We saw the example of the physician that prescribed an, a medication that was contraindicated for his patient. Um, having support, having evidence at his fingertips at the point of care would have prevented this. Okay, devices that automate medication dosing, those can reduce human error quite a bit. Um, what else? Uh, any downside to devices? What can go wrong with devices? Any thoughts on that? Oh, a device is down, yeah. And the device is down but no alerts that there's something wrong or, Chris, that they can malfunction. And hopefully there's an alert built in that notifies the providers that something is amiss. Oh, Vivian, alert fatigue. Yes, sometimes there's so many that they pay absolutely no attention to it. That's a problem. And devices need to be maintained, and people need to be trained in their use. Um, technology can help with patient safety also because it, an electronic medical record provides records of what went on with each patient, and data can be analyzed so that people, um, so that administrators can see where errors are occurring and identify system failures. Okay, so let's step back to being faculty and look at this 
webinar as a training device. Um, what were the different ways that I tried to engage you in the topic? Polling, mm-hmm. Asked a lot of questions, yes. <laughs> Pictures of nice rocks. <laughs> they were gems, Lisa. The gems that you all were providing, okay? Polls and a lot of questions. Yeah, I kept you busy, and let's go back, let's go back to the Okay, those were the two learning objectives. And obviously, I would have made it a little longer if it was an actual training session, but I didn't want to bore the living daylights out of you. But it's a more interesting way to get at these two learning objectives versus just presenting a bunch of PowerPoint slides and telling students the different types of errors. So they actually had to apply it. Stories, yeah, and how about, how about let's look at adult learning principles um, in the context of this. How did you feel as participants when your comments are acknowledged? Anybody? So when I thank you for your comment or you make an interesting point and I, I mention that to the group, how does that make you feel? Oh, my goodness. It wasn't advancing. Okay. Yeah, great. And it makes you feel makes you feel acknowledged, encouraged, yeah, and valued. Yeah, and adult learners, you know, they, they come to our classes with a lot of life experience and a lot of knowledge. So they like to be respected. They expect it. Um, and Lisa. Yes, we would like to hear a Boeing story. <laughs> so, Lisa, if you could unmute your mic. I'm so glad that you mentioned the book about checklists, um, or the, the person behind it, because I think I, I've been searching for that. I heard some part on the radio about it, and so great, now I found it. I, I think I found what, I, what I've been looking for. But um, on that note, uh, I've done a lot of training at Boeing, and some people have shared uh, this information with me that work on the factory floor. There was a time at Boeing, and you know, if anyone's worked at Boeing and you know more, uh, you know, chime in, but there was a time at Boeing when the people who were working on the flight line um, had to check out tools from Boeing. So Boeing maintained and owned the tools. And then perhaps to save costs, or in, there could be a number of reasons you can speculate, they asked each employee to purchase their own tools and maintain their own tools. Well, the issue with that is that if somebody goes into a plane and they lose a particular tool, they're not going to alert anyone because they'll look bad. And they don't have to alert anyone because no one is using a checklist to make sure they're not doing a check-in huh. without the tool. So they'll simply eat the cost, uh, therefore they won't get into trouble. But <laughs> um, there have been a couple of cases where you know the worry was, given the plane accident, that there was a tool rattling around um, <laughs> but the Air Force, uh, anywhere where they're maintaining planes, they still have the old system where you don't own the tools, the tools are checked in and out. So they know if you come back and you have 99 out of 100 tools, they know, okay, there's a tool missing and we need to go find that. So um, not to Interesting. Rattle, not flying, but, you know, <laughs> boy, I wish one would return to <laughs> the old system. <laughs> You know, that's an interesting story and so um, so, so relevant to, to surgery. <laughs> no, no, I don't know what the, what the uh, incentives are in the hospitals. I hope they don't have to maintain their own tools. 
Uh, no, I don't think it's bring your own scalpel, <laughs> fortunately. <laughs> okay. So, thank you all for being so engaged and participating so actively. Makes it really fun. Um, don't think we have to go over the technical aspects. Something that we always do, though, is uh, always do a dry run with webinars because there's always something, even even when you've done use the tools a lot, um, there's something that doesn't show up right or something. So we always have someone log in as a participant and go through this. So what do you see on your screen? That kind of thing. Um, best to have a buddy. So Roger, I'm always happy to have Roger in webinars. Makes me feel very confident, um, giving people a little tour of the platform, which we did last time. And then images, giving people tasks, questions, acknowledging people, and a technical rehearsal. So in the few minutes we have left, um, I wanted to let you know about a few resources. Chris and Amy, I believe that you both know about the ONC materials. Is that correct? That's correct. Roger asked, is he Robin? <laughs> you could be Batman. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. So, Lisa, I'm, I'm just going to tell you very quickly, there is this wealth of resources um, created by the five universities you see in front of you here. Um, it was funded with a federal grant, and they created about 1,000 hours worth of co content in the area of healthcare, IT, and health IT. And the audiences, the, the intended audiences were healthcare professionals and IT professionals. Um, and they divided the materials into 20 components with eight to 12 units in each component. So Lisa, if you ever feel like diving in, um, We'd be happy to give you a little a little tour and give you some tips on how to wade through the content to find what you're looking for. Okay. I also wanted to let some of you know, Amy, I know you're going to be teaching CA hymns at Spokane, and Vivian, I know you're working on materials as well. Um, and Amy, I don't know if you have access to the HIT education site yet, if you've seen that. Um, I got an email yesterday. I think it was information to log on, but I haven't looked at that yet. Okay, and that might have also been, so there are a couple of things. Um, in another grant, Bellevue College, um, in partnership with HIMSS, created a new health IT industry certification called uh, CA HIMSS, and um, we also created an initial curriculum to go with that, and that can be found at this link, and I will send you all information on that. But there is also another parallel project going on right now in collaboration with Carnegie Mellon, and I'm going to just show you a little bit on what they've created. So CA HIMSS has nine units, and let me share my desktop. And CA HIMSS has about anywhere from 100 to 165 hours, depending on how deep a dive people want to do into the topic. And these are the key areas, healthcare environment, technology environment, health information management systems analysis and design, selection and acquisition, implementation and management, testing and evaluation, privacy and security, leadership and planning, and professionalism and communication skills. And what, what we're doing is we and um, another DOL grant recipient in Missouri are working with Carnegie Mellon. They have a team of learning engineers, um, proof copy editors, 
um, and technical people, in addition to a group called CAST, who works with us on universal design, and they have um, an assessment expert. And we're taking the CA HIMSS content and creating new instructional materials. And the materials are fantastic. They're incredibly labor intensive to create, but let me show you what those look like. So here is an example of one module in the very first unit of CA HIMSS. And everything is organized by page in the Carnegie Mellon system. Um, and let me show you a page. So we started with ONC content. Oh, it logged me out. And then we rewrote. So here, this is about long-term care facilities. So we rewrote the content to be more user-friendly. And in, in many cases, there are almost like little scenarios built in. There are characters created, um, facilities created. And the CAST team, the universal design team, are fantastic with images. So they've added images to help people cognitively process the information. You'll see a lot of images. And then there are all these learn by doing activities um, that include hints. So somebody would like a hint on this one. Many of them have scenarios built in. And those learn by doings are ungraded. And it kind of goes on from there. Um, and then there are some nice little things added that are not essential, but students might be interested in. And then there are assessment questions at the end. These pages take, let's see, about, about 50 hours of effort on the part of everyone on the team. You know, so, well, maybe somewhere between, probably somewhere between 25 and 50 hours per page. So a lot of effort goes in. And um, you, can, you can lift things from their site as long as you attribute Carnegie Mellon, or you can seamlessly integrate them into your own courses. Students don't need to log in to Carnegie Mellon site to access the materials. You can integrate them into your course. So if anyone is interested in pursuing this, just let us know, and we'll help with that. We'll connect you with people at Carnegie Mellon who are eager to have people pilot this. Um, unit 1 is currently available. Unit 2 will be available December 15th. And they'll be releasing each unit um, as it's developed. And all nine units will be completed um, November, this time next year. So any questions on that? I wanted to show you one, actually one other item before we leave. Okay, on our HIT education site, and I'll send links, I'll, I'll follow up with links on all of this. We have health IT instructional materials that are searchable. So for example, and these are all um, open source items created uh, by people who are part of this grant or things that people have found online. So as I say, they're tagged by topic. Feel free to peruse these items and use anything you'd like in your courses. And again, I'll send a link on that. Okay, well, we are, oh, and 
one other item on enterlearning.org. Uh, we created a lot of different classes as part of our last grant, and these are all open source materials as well that you might want to use. And there are things in the resources section, like clinical workflow videos and games. We have um, some, I think, some pretty good resources on workflow, actually. We had professional, um, a professional video crew, and there's a nice little package there. And if you have any trouble accessing it, just give me a holler. All right. Um, any final questions or comments? If you're able to stay for two more minutes, I'd love to just mention EMR Star. It's a cloud-based system that will provide access to multiple EMR systems. We currently have two open source systems, OpenEMR, which is just outpatient, and Vista CPRS, which is primarily inpatient. Ultimately, we'll have five or more systems um, by the end of the grant, and there'll be lab activities to go with each one. And if you have more questions about that, just give me a holler. So online materials will be available until the end of January. You'll be receiving from me um, a, a little survey monkey about the webinars, about the online materials. And any suggestions you have, we'll, we'll probably be offering another round um, for any other faculty who are interested in health IT, um, probably in April. And we'd love to have your feedback um, so that we can improve next time around. Any final comments or questions? It's been a, a pleasure getting to know you all. And let's see. Oops. Just lost my chat pane for a second here. OK. And will April be a repeat? It will. Yes, Lisa. And Chris and Amy, thank you for being our resident experts. And Amy, if you decide to, if you'd like to learn more about um, the, the Carnegie Mellon CA HIMSS content, um, just give me a holler, and I'm happy to you know, give you a little tour of the resources and help you with any access issues. All right, we'll have a great afternoon or Chris evening in your case. All right, take care. Thank you all. Thanks, Margaret. <laughs>